Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Marian Churto, who is a professor of industrial environmental management at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Her research and teaching focus on industrial ecology, circular economy, waste management, and urban sustainability. Her research has championed the study of industrial symbiosis involving geographically based exchanges of materials, energy, water, and wastes within networks of business globally. She also has carried out many studies of industrial ecology in China, India, and other emerging market countries as a way to value environmental benefits alongside economic ones. Today, we'll talk with Professor Churto about industrial ecology and symbiosis in the developing world. Welcome, Professor Churto. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to be here. Let's start with just defining some terms that perhaps some people might not be familiar with it, familiar with specifically industrial ecology and industrial symbiosis. Well, that's a great place to start. I'd like to start with industrial ecology which is a new-ish interdisciplinary field. Suddenly, 20 years go by, and uh, we realize the field is getting more established. Industrial ecology is about the flow of physical materials and energy through systems at different scales. So a factory is a system, and a city is a system. We look at countries, we look at regions, and ultimately, we look at the whole globe to ask the question, what are the materials and energy going in? What's going out? What stays behind where it ought to be, or maybe not? And all of this is the study of industrial ecology, the study of these use of resources and the transformation of resources, which makes everything. And human life, nor could nature live without the constant flow of materials and energy. Mm -hmm. And symbiosis. So industrial symbiosis we call a, a subpart of industrial ecology. It's my specialty. And what I look at is the same idea of material and energy flows, but the system is a little bit different. The system is typically a cluster of companies, an industrial park, something where a group of companies are all uh, working in the same vicinity, more or less, mm -hmm. but they have different inputs and different outputs from their industrial processes. And um, we believe that by looking at that carefully and understanding who has what inputs and outputs, we can create a lot of efficiencies because we're spining all over the world that even without professors, uh, this sharing is being done. And with a little bit more guidance, we can increase the rate at which these companies are willing to share and therefore conserve mm -hmm. resources and sometimes even gain a new revenue stream. So if, okay. you're, if you used to sell something, if something used to be construed as a waste and now it's construed as a, a, a resource, then you can turn that into a revenue stream. Okay. And I am curious to know what led you to study this? Well, I'll tell you the truth. Um, a lot of my background before I became a professor was in waste management. Mm -hmm. And that's in part because I grew up in the area, in the era, oof, I grew up in the arena where waste and recycling were starting to be taken seriously mm -hmm. after Earth Day and so forth. And I got involved in that field accidentally the way a lot of students do when they take their first job. I worked for a recycling company and I realized just how much we were throwing away mm -hmm. and how little we were recovering and how much better the world could be if we, mm -hmm. if we conserved our resources. So that was really uh, the start of, of that. And what I realized about waste is that you simply can't solve the waste problem by only talking about waste. Waste is at the end of the pipe. It's at the end of the system. Mm -hmm. And in order to solve a problem like waste, you have to look at the whole system, back to the raw materials, back to the mines, uh, back to the way we pro process things, the way that we distribute products and where they land. All of this is a big chain that has to be considered if we want to reduce waste or not even create as much waste in the first place because we're able to put it back into the industry. Mm -hmm. Now, you um, have received recently um, a very um, prestigious award um, from 
remind me of what the agency is. The International Society for Industrial Ecology. Right, for work that you have done um, with uh, really moving forward the subheading of symbiosis. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things that you have um, really worked on to move that field forward? Well, of course, um, from our perspective, uh, we're, we're interested in improving the principles that surround these fields so that people all over the world can, can, in, can, in, um, can engage with them. Mm -hmm. So let me set out a couple of examples good, and, good. and then I think it'll be clear. Uh, we have the most famous industrial uh, symbiosis example is in Denmark. And what happened without urging from the government or, or much other uh, external behavior, the companies in this small city of Kalimburg figured out on their own that they could exchange resources. It was the same time period where people were getting their some dolt of environmental awareness. Mm -hmm. And a group of uh, managers who knew each other from the town, who belonged to the Rotary Club, whose children played soccer together, uh, recognized that one company's waste product could easily become another company's food. And so, for example, there's a power plant that uh, has a lot of steam, and so the steam could be used by the pharmaceutical plant and the refinery, and waste from those uh, projects, uh, those uh, industries could be used in wholly different ways. And so pretty soon we had an image of rather than waste, each of these um, outputs was being used in a creative way, sometimes with treatment. So for example, the, uh, the air pollution stream from the power plant could actually be captured as a chemical that uh, is the chemical behind gypsum, so calcium sulfate. So with this gypsum, sure enough, a, a gypsum board company moved in mm -hmm. and that created economic development, it created jobs, and it was more efficient for the company because they could get their raw materials from right next door. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we really understood this model and even the fact that it was self-organized from people talking with one another, uh, that gave us so much inspiration to say, well, this self-organization is an important principle, and we should look for other basic industrial uh, clusters where such things would be likely to happen. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that took us many years to kind of sort out and make lists of how efficient are these plants, mm -hmm. how are they looking not only today but on a whole life cycle basis, and that's one of the important ideas of industrial ecology is to look across the whole life cycle and um, how can you minimize the waste streams. And mm -hmm. So um, indeed when we became better researchers, we realized that there are many ways that this happens. In industrialized countries like China, where so much is made, it's you know the factory for the world, right. there we saw that oftentimes there was a lot of government direction. But it was the same phenomenon, that with a, a proper committee and so forth, uh, then people could figure out that there were good solutions for companies in much larger industrial parks uh, than the ones we typically see in other parts of the world, where they too could share and conserve water, wastewater, uh, uh, solid waste, mm -hmm. uh, commercial waste, uh, energy flows, steam. All of these things were up for grabs uh, if we could do it right and allow them to take advantage of the symbiotic relationship of sharing. Mm -hmm. um, Rather than just kind of ignoring each other in the in the uh, in this general industrial park, mm -hmm. we uh, we for many years we visited Puerto Rico because it's nearby. It it's, has a strong industrial heritage in these last uh, thirty or forty years, and uh, there we could see everything. Sometimes there would be a couple of guys mm -hmm. driving their mustangs into the plant in the morning, and well, they just got to talking, and pretty soon there was some kind of a relationship of exchanging materials and waste. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes it was more the other, where you knew that if you could uh, take ash from a, a plant that was burning things and use that for construction materials, all of these things are beneficial. So I don't want to claim that we discovered that these exchanges are beneficial. That's not the point. The point is that there are many of them that fly under the radar, mm -hmm. that there are just companies that are doing it 
because they can, and it saves them transportation costs mm -hmm. of bringing in material from somewhere right, else. Right, right. Um, and so what we've been able to do is catalog them and to uh, put, shine the spotlight on them and saying, by doing this, we're saving you know, this much air pollution and this much water pollution, mm -hmm. and we're uh, creating new revenue streams. Right. All of those things are uh, important to make them visible. And so we've been able to do that. And of course, when other uh, commercial operations see these, they say, well, maybe we could do that in, mm -hmm. in our system. So right, for right. in the area of industrial symbiosis, uh, it's, it really is something uh, contagious. And um, it wouldn't it be great if we could keep all that stuff in play and not really have to treat it as waste. Right, right. So how far along do you think um, this, the United States is in terms of embracing that? I mean, do you think you're um, relatively successful in getting the word out about how that works? I mean, do you go out um, into different areas of the country that are, you know, manufacturing and, and consult with them perhaps? Or, you know, how are you growing the field in that regard? So I believe we're growing the field, but not so much in the United States. Okay. Um, the U.S. has lots of land. The U.S. has lots of resources. And uh, we're working on it. We're, we have a National Science Foundation study that we've been working on for the last two years uh, where we're trying to match um, every county. We're trying to understand every county in the United States and what kinds of industrial facilities it has and what kind of waste it has. And mm -hmm. we have some great databases. We're the only ones that have them. Uh, we're able to create the GIS um, that will show us. But even then, there are always obstacles. So uh, that's a, an ambitious example. I've been very impressed with what happens in uh, emerging market countries mm -hmm. where uh, waste is a material. Waste is, uh, if you don't have a lot, if, you, if you're in a poor country, uh, this need to throw out things is not as uh, is relevant. Problematic, right. Yeah. Uh, so we, f we looked at a site in India, this was our best result ever in our research, where there were 45 companies in an industrial park not that far from Bangalore, uh, India, you know, that's the Silicon Valley of, of uh, India. And um, just because, again, there was some social capital, people knew each other, they worked uh, on different things together, they had lunches and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, that these companies uh, were doing a lot of symbiotic things and because we were willing to study it in detail, we actually got from all 45 countries everything that's coming into their plant, everything that stays in their plant, everything that goes out of their plant. And when we added that all up, there was a million tons of what many people would call waste and what we would call, you know, material out of place. Mm -hmm. um, so when we actually finished the analysis and saw that so much of it actually was being recaptured by another facility or sometimes within the same facility, mm -hmm. that 99.5% of that million tons was being reused or recycled at least once. Wow. I mean, that is a circular economy. It certainly is. And um, because industrial ecology students at Yale are quite adventurous, um, some of them took it upon themselves to find out where that last little half percent yeah. was going. <laughs> <laughs> Did they find out? Yeah. They, where was it going? Well, uh, <laughs> it was so interesting. Um, you know, we'd look, we'd an interview a factory owner and he'd say, well, you know, here's how we do this and here's how, where our materials go. And that pile, uh, Mr. Kumar comes in at five o'clock and picks it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, where does that pile go? And so, of course, uh, we have a saying in industrial ecology that industrial ecologists follow the materials. Yes. So my students were jumping in taxis and cabs and following these people through town and um, actually, yes, finding out just what was happening, that even the, w even the part that was not usable by the 45 companies in the industrial park was usable to somebody. Right. And the sale of that was what put breakfast on the table the next morning for their kids, mm -hmm. even if it was just a few rupees. So right. Um, that was a great lesson to us, that, that it, uh, waste uh, has more value in a developing country, typically, but also that if you treat it right, it, you, at least you can use the value that is sure, there. Sure, that it is worth um, trying to make it happen. Yeah. So I know you're doing work in Africa as well. Tell us what you're doing there. 
Well, um, I've worked in several countries, but uh, the one that we're working on right now is in Rwanda. Okay. And Rwanda, uh, there we're working on apparel, clothing. It's a really interesting issue, and I'll try to explain it briefly, but I tend to get carried away when I talk about it. Okay. Um, you, you know from watching the, the TV and reading the news that so many of our Western clothing, you know, our, our, our clothing that we don't want anymore, gets shipped to African countries and, and other countries. But East Africa is a real place where they go, is uh, so many articles and garments of clothing. Um, so uh, what we're looking at is some of the East African countries are saying, we don't want this anymore. We used to have a modest amount, and it was nice, but now there's so much which we do. And Rwanda is really leading that charge uh, in East Africa. And they're saying, why should we take this clothing? It, we, it denies our ability to have a domestic market, and we want to employ all our people and move up the economic scale. Mm -hmm. So let's have domestic industries. And so they've been working on domestic industries, and they've put a huge tariff on the used clothing that's coming in from Germany and UK and US and mm -hmm. so forth. So that's discouraging uh, used clothing from coming in. On the other hand, uh, China is very active in Africa, as we know. And uh, they have a factory there. Um, they also bring in a lot of less expensive uh, new clothing. And of course, Rwanda wants to make its own clothing and even has a law called Made in Rwanda because they want to make everything in Rwanda mm -hmm. so that people can have jobs. So you have this interesting superpower clash at the level of China and the US because uh, um, under the Trump administration, uh, we had a little tariff battle about East African clothing even. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, that's been a prominent you know, tool for, for, the U for, for incentives there. So w we look at kind of the, you know, the, the superpower level and we look at the East Africa regional level. Mm -hmm. you know, it turns out that Tanzania and Kenya are handling this differently than Rwanda. <laughs> and we want to see if the very bold experiments in Rwanda can work out mm -hmm. and market, uh, clothing can be made at a market rate that's affordable to, the, to some very poor people there. Um, and so all of this it relates to industrial ecology because we're thinking so much about reuse of clothing. Reused clothing comes in from, from the West, and of course the West thinks that's a great economic and environmental solution, right. but that's not how it's perceived. And so how el what else can we do uh, to close the loop? Right. And, and that's really the part that, that brings in industrial ecology. Of course, we work with development economists and others who mm -hmm. um, also want to keep track of the economics. But what a fascinating application for us, for industrial ecology, because Rwanda it says right out loud, we're trying to create a circular economy mm -hmm. where we don't have the waste and we are reusing it. We don't have a linear economy, but we have a circular economy where clothing and many other goods cycle. Right. You know? um, and that's uh, the exciting work that we're working on this semester. And what about next steps? Well, um, I think that w what we see in the future is an interesting blend of technology, uh, high technology, the need for jobs, uh, going, ha you know, going wanting. Um, I just came from a presentation about uh, high tech knitting machines for uh, apparel. Mm -hmm. And these are typically happening in Asia and, and Europe. They're very high speed. You know, you can program them so the, they're very accurate in making the, the knitted goods. And, um, and the speaker started out by saying, well, you know, when we cut a piece of a garment, about 30% of it goes to waste. And so I thought, well, there's a big waste stream here, but let's keep talking. Let's keep looking at these knitting machines. And of course, by the end, the knitting machines are uh, are endlessly. For you asked me about the future. You know, their 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 capabilities will go up, their prices will come down a little bit. Um, but at the end of life, and this is still true, because industrial ecologists are always thinking about systems, system science. You know, always considering. At the end of life, there's 85 percent disposal to landfills. Mm -hmm. So you get these great knitting machines. <laughs> There's a bunch of waste. You, you go through the whole system of the right. supply chains and so forth, and then you still get to a place where 
Uh, there's very little to do. And no one's, you know, jumping on it enough mm -hmm. to figure out what do we do at the end of life when we're landfilling so we much to, clothing yeah, we need all to, over the world. Exactly. We need to start at the beginning and say less is more. Less is more or let's design a system, not just an entry point where these these kinds of types of manufacturers can make money but you know, and leave out mm -hmm. what happens to the earth right, in the last right. part. So I would say that uh, these kinds of experiences fortify me as a professor and as former president of our uh, industrial ecology society to say, you know, these are some open fronts. Uh, we can't look at these only in, with this lens, but mm -hmm. we need multiple lenses. Um, you can see that uh, although I've stressed the physical side of this here, in Rwanda it becomes a social problem. You know, where do poor people get their clothing mm -hmm. and how will it cycle to them? Right. And how do we consider these things that spring right out of the, uh, the question of resource management, right. right? Because resources might get managed physically, but then what happens? Right. And that's where we interface so much with the social sciences, which makes industrial ecology such a rich and useful enterprise. Right, right. It certainly is. I mean, you know, I think we're at a crisis point um, with so many, so much trash in the world, in the oceans, plastic, it's quite a problem, so. Yeah, and it's getting a lot of attention right now, so, you know, you're interviewing me, I'm grateful, but uh, when people didn't really care about waste mm -hmm. <laughs> and plastics and so forth, uh, you know, you kind of just have a silent period for a few years, and, and now it's just so fascinating to me, the phone's ringing, the media's calling, mm -hmm. and um, it's really, the heart of that is, not having a systems approach to our to our material for Right, exactly. Well, thank you so much for being here and sharing some of your work with us. It's my pleasure. I love to share this work, and you were wonderful to listen. Thank you. For more information about Professor Cherto and her research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.